As paramedics, we may be called upon in order to manage a intubated patient for inter intrafacility transport, or we may intubate a patient and transport that patient to the hospitals that maybe are a little bit further away, as we need to manage that patient during that period of time. And it's easy to get short-sighted or to focus only solely on the intubation itself and forget that there's other things that need to be done prior to just that intubation, like pre-intubation kind of checklists and resuscitation, and of course, post-intubation intubation, sedation, and analgesia, which is what we're going to talk about in this GEMS article. at this from the patient's perspective. If you think about it, we've just intubated this patient. We've stuck an ET tube down their throat and now inflated a cuff in a very unnatural position for this particular patient. So that's one thing that that patient can definitely feel if we have an under sedated and under managed patient. So that's something to really take in consideration. Another big thing is that now we're trying to ventilate them with a bag valve mask against what their body wants to do, which is again, a very unnatural process to have a higher levels of pressure and to be having someone breathe for you, especially if we again, have an under sedated and, un and a decrease or low analgesic effect in our patients, which is something that we need to address in our post sedation type of checklist to make sure that our patient is being properly managed, not just in the pre and the during of the intubation, but after the intubation as well to make sure our patients are sedated and they have a proper amount of pain control. So that way we don't make this process incredibly terrifying and painful for this particular patient. We also know that we have better outcomes with these patients when we have a proper sedation and proper pain control, so that way they are more comfortable. We actually are not fighting against this patient when we have that in place. So like I just said, sedation and analgesia need to be the go-to in order to basically control this patient and make it as comfortable as we possibly can. Because again, we're going against the body's natural state. We're putting a endotracheal tube into this patient that's incredibly uncomfortable and again, unnatural for this patient. And so the body immediately and instinctively wants to go under stress because of that pain and because of the unnatural natures of artificial ventilation. And so what is a big thing that we want to mention here at the very beginning is that if you have a patient that is fighting against you is not very well controlled due to the fact that maybe their sedation or their pain control is not at the point that it needs to be, the next grab should not be a paralytic in order to recontrol that patient. Because again, we know that paralytics do not control the mentation. They do not control the pain or the respiratory drive that the body wants to create. So all we're really doing is not decreasing any perception whatsoever and just simply paralyzing the body. Imagine how terrifying that would be for your patient. And so what we need to do if we have a patient that is not, uh, that is under stress, we need to be reaching for more sedation and more analgesia as opposed to our paralytic. Not saying that it's never something that we do, but it's very rare and never before we have sedation and analgesia under control. Now we have two things we need to take care of here for this particular patient after the intubation is that we need to make sure that we're managing the sedation of this patient as well as the analgesia. Now, as far as the, the pain control goes and the sedation goes, there's only one particular drug that we could rely on that can do both of those. And that is ketamine. And we're going to talk about ketamine a little bit later, but if we didn't go with ketamine, if we didn't have the option of going with ketamine, there are some other drugs we can use in combination in order to achieve the effect we're looking for. Again, we're looking for sedation. Okay. And we're looking for pain control, which is again, analgesia. And when it comes to those types of things, we have a few different drugs that end up under uh, sedation, like Atomidate uh, or ketamine, like I just said, Versed, Propofol, all un fall under the sedation side of things. One thing I should mention here is that all those drugs, except for ketamine, have a, a chance or a likelihood of decreasing the blood pressure, creating a potential of hypotension, which may not be the benefit for this particular patient. So keep that in mind as well. 
well that we may need to be careful in using sedation because of the decreases in blood pressure that we see using those types of sedatives. And on the analgesia side, we have the biggest one that we're going to see is fentanyl uh, being used for analgesia purposes for this post intubation patient in order to reduce that pain perception so that way this patient is a lot more comfortable and easier to ventilate on transport to the hospital but again ketamine would fall under this pain control side as well and again it falls under both sides of that fence so that may be something that you want to look at but a common combination outside of ketamine would be something like versed and then fentanyl for your pain control that's a common combination people still really like to use atominate as well the only thing is that typically Typically, Atomidate doesn't last very well, and most protocols, if not all protocols, only allow you to give Atomidate once, which really limits your ability to manage this patient ongoing if you have a longer transport. So those are the big things you need to be thinking about when it comes to making the choice. And what can really help you make this choice is the clinical presentation of this patient. So if you have a patient that is uh, that has a lower blood pressure, that is hypotension, and you want to make sure that we're not creating more hypotension, we need to make sure that we are selecting sedation and pain control to make sure that we're not going to precipitate to that. So if we have a patient that's already in a decompensated or almost decompensated state of shock, using something like ketamine that has more of a catecholamine and sympathetic effect, uh, is gonna be a more effective for this patient and a better clinical choice here when we're trying to continue the sedation and continue pain control when we don't want to decrease blood pressures because of our drugs so that's a big easy a thing to be thinking about with okay we're on our way to the hospital what are we going to use in order to manage this patient's sedation and pain control and look at the clinical picture of this patient if they are again in a decompensated state which a lot of our patients are then maybe switching to something like ketamine is a better choice as opposed to going to something like versed which has a high profile of decrease Increasing your blood pressures, especially when we start using higher levels of it or higher amounts of that. So something to really think about when it comes to those types of patients that really shouldn't have drops in blood pressure. So like I said, most sedatives do have a, an opportunity or a chance of decreasing the blood pressure just by their pharmacology. So keep in mind that there might be a time that you need to set up fluids or small amounts of fluids or vasopressors as well, something like norepinephrine, in order to manage those decreases in blood pressure or switch out that medication that's causing the decreases in blood pressure with something that's a little bit less vasoactive in a sense. And so that is something to really look at. But again, if you're looking at a patient and their maps aren't doing amazing, but they're not to the point where you're super concerned, but you know that that drug that you're going to start is going to drop that blood pressure further. You might want to have a little bit of foresight here and think, okay, maybe I should hang some fluids or should I prepare some norepi in case I need to combat that decrease in blood pressure. Having that critical thinking or that thought process is really important, especially if you have a longer transport time to make sure that this patient is properly sedated, but we also don't want to injure or damage the clinical picture of our patient during transport because of our pharmacology choices. So as far as delivering these drugs, so for example, if we were trying to, if we were going to give uh, Versed fentanyl as our example, so um, we're gonna give Versed, okay, and then fentanyl. Okay, when it comes to those types of drugs, there's two ways in order to deliver this. We can either do bolus doses or we can do infusion doses. Now, typically what we're going to do in the beginning is that we're going to attempt what we call a breakthrough dosing, meaning that we're gonna use a milligram or, yeah, milligram or microgram per kilogram dose to make sure that we have a breakthrough dose. Again, follow your local protocols for this, but we typically would have a bolus dose in this particular situation, get the patient in a good setted or settled state to make sure that they're not going to get uncomfortable or be in pain during that transport. So that's typically what we're gonna do first is that we're going to bolus these particular drugs to make sure that again we get to that breakthrough side of sedation and breakthrough side of pain control and then we're going to at that point if you have the ability to do it do an infusion and start an infusions on Versed and fentanyl after you have that breakthrough so that way again we don't have those peaks and valleys we typically see with bolusing when we have a patient that okay has a decrease in sedation and decrease in pain control because those drugs are kind of nearing those half-lives 
and, and then we bolus them again once we see the clinical change in our patients and our vital signs and the way that they're acting. And it just really has a lot more of this roller coaster effect. Whereas with an infusion, it's continuous. After we have that breakthrough bolus and start them on infusions, we can find that sweet spot in an infusion and maintain their level of sedation and maintain their level of pain control. So that way they are not having those really big peaks and valleys and kind of being more coherent and having perception of pain to not so much after you recognize that because when it comes to a high paced high stress environment it's very easy to realize that 5 or 10 or 15 minutes has gone by and maybe you haven't had a chance or haven't thought about rebolusing them yet and now you have a patient with their heart rate at 120. That's really what you're trying to avoid here by using infusions as opposed to just continuously bolusing but obviously not all of us have that opportunity to use an infusion and so we would use bolus doses at a good Q moment and we're going to talk about in, in a, just a sec here what we're looking for in order to identify when our patient is not properly sedated or under sedated and uh, has a more perception of pain. So when it comes to patient monitoring, there's a few things that you're going to look for. And what I wanted to mention first is the heart rate. And I believe the heart rate is a really good indicator of the stress of that particular patient. And so after you do a full sedation, so let's say you do your bolus dosing of your particular patient, you do your Versed, you do your fentanyl, and let's say your heart rate is, and you get a good kind of baseline of what your heart rate is when this patient you know is properly sedated because you just gave those medications and you can see that the patient is clinically doing well. And so in that particular state, what you want to do is look at the heart rate and if the heart rate say at you know 90s or 95 something along those lines where it's a little bit you know high because their body's under stress we don't typically intubate and ventilate patients that are not but you want to look at where that heart rate is right after the sedation has been given it's so that way you have a good baseline and what you're going to be looking for is any increases in that so let's say our baseline is 95 or 96 as our heart rate per minute and all of a sudden 10 15 minutes later we look and see the heart rate is 119 120 there's two things you're going to look for is has there been any mass changes in this patient or is our sedation and pain control wearing off and our patient is now under stress and that's why we're seeing an increase in that heart rate. So those are the things that you're looking for to go, maybe I need to resedate this patient or add more pain control for this patient because again, that heart rate is often going to be because of the added stress that your patient is under due to the fact that they're starting to wake up and be stressed. Again, it's not the only reason you need to look at the clinical picture of this patient and if the clinical picture or something is massively changed change in the last 15 minutes that may be the reason why you've seen such a massive climb but you need to identify that you need to do your assessment you need to quickly check that out make sure that there's nothing clinically changing with this patient and then address the sedation as well to make sure that we don't continually allow this heart rate to go up because they have an increased perception of what's going on because we're wearing out our drugs so that's the first thing that we want to look for to indicate to us that our patient needs to be resedated and increased pain control so that way, again, we can try and control that heart rate and control the stress levels of our patients. So when it comes to an intubated patient, at the time of intubation, uh, we need to expect that we're going to have a decrease in blood pressure. And that's gonna be for a few reasons. One, we know that we have a decrease in uh, respiratory drive. And so if we stop breathing, then we're going to have a decrease in basically sympathetic tone. And during that time of decreased sympathetic tone, we're gonna have a drop in blood pressure. When we start to ventilate these patients with a BVM, we tend to increase thoracic pressures inside the ball inside the thorax which ultimately puts pressure on this right ventricle which means that we're going to have a lot less blood return to that right ventricle when if we are very hypervigilant with our bvm and causing an increase in pressure there decreasing blood return back to the heart so that's something that we got to look out for but that's going to cause a decrease in blood pressure as well and including the medications that we typically use something like versed or propofol or atomidate all those types of things will cause a decrease in blood pressure as well so we have a lot of things that are actually fighting against this blood pressure that we need to make sure that we are maintaining a good map of at least 65 and so we want to 
make sure that we're not causing that. And so like they said, the pathology is also going to be something we're going to be looking for. The sedation is something that we're concerned about. The analgesia is definitely going to cause a small decrease in blood pressure depending on where, what you're using. And of course, the increased thoracic pressures, that's going to decrease blood return to the right side of this heart. That's ultimately going to decrease systemic blood pressure. But that being said, we want to make sure we're maintaining a map of 60 Okay, 65, okay, above 65 is typically our benchmark of what we're trying to do here. Now, as far as this map of 65, there's a few things that we can do in order to manage this map of 65, is first off, we can try and do some fluids. Now you've probably seen a few of the videos that we've done about fluids and how we're really cautious with fluids now. I'm not talking about bolusing this patient 20 mils by kilo. I'm talking about simply giving this patient some fluids if their pathology actually allows a little bit of fluid addition uh, in order to do that. If they don't, if they have a pathology that's really not a good idea in order to add more overload of fluids, maybe not and go with something else. But I'm talking about a little bit of fluids in order to maintain a little bit more of that vascular fluid to hopefully get some more blood moving through this heart. So that's one thing that we can do in order to improve uh, the blood pressure or the MAP. Another big thing that we can do is making sure that we have a vasopressor, okay? A vasopressor is going to definitely allow us to maintain that blood pressure as well and so I usually I typically will prep a vasopressor prior to my intubation especially in a patient that has a really you know high likelihood of having a decrease in blood pressure that's going to be damaging to that particular patient I'll often get get a vasopressor ready even before the intubation attempt and so that's something that you're going to be looking at there as well to combat any decreases in blood pressure and then of course we need to make sure that we are keeping an eye on our sedation and if we are using something like Versed and fentanyl and we're noticing this patient's blood pressure is getting worse and worse and worse we may have to go and kind of talk to our partner and be like hey we're looking at a patient that has a kind of a, a clinical picture here that's not really doing well with a patient that has a decrease in blood pressure maybe we should be switching from a a medication like Versa that has a opportunity to cause vasodilation and switching to something like ketamine that is more vasoconstrictive and more sympathetic to this whole patient. So that might be something you need to look at and have a conversation with your patient or with your partner on and making sure that we're not making any uh, precipitating to this problem any further. It's basically what I'm trying to say. And so again, if you're anticipating a drop in blood pressure with this intubation attempt, which in almost all intubation attempts, we should be expecting a drop in blood pressure. Make sure you're getting ready some fluids and some vasopressors in order to maintain a MAP of 65. And if you continue to see this patient drop a MAP below 65, or they're getting worse and worse and worse during for your transport, and you're using something like propofol or Versed or one of those types of, you know, more those drugs that are more precipitating to a lower blood pressure and hypotension, then it might be a good conversation to have with your partner about switching to something like ketamine that's not going to precipitate to a problem that you already know exists with these types of patients in their hypotension. So that is something to really think about when it comes to a cardiac output and blood pressure is that there are things that we can do in order to combat that and there's also things that we're going to be doing with our intubation and our continuous ventilation that's going to cause that decrease in blood pressure. So we need to be cautious about these things as well and make sure you're keeping an eye on how well your ventilations are going you may be over ventilating this patient causing an even less decrease or decrease of blood flow through that right ventricle causing a decrease in systemic pressure as well so lots of things to think about at this particular stage but your blood pressure needs to be something that's constantly monitored on a regular basis and you'd be troubleshooting any changes in it that you need to take care of so there's a lot to really be understanding here when it comes to ventilating a patient on tra for transport to a hospital or interfacility transport. Obviously, we understand that we can't cover that in just one video. And so we thought we would just cover the sedation side or the pharmacology side in this video. And we're going to make sure we create a series to help you understand how to mechanically ventilate a patient properly, how to transport these patients and give them the best outcome they need. So hopefully you took something from this video and making sure that you kind of understand the sedation and pain control side 
side of things and using that to make sure that we properly monitoring and managing our patients on uh, to a pa onto a hospital. So hopefully that was really helpful for you. Make sure you check out that article on the GEMS magazines uh, online on the GEMS website. So that way you can better understand kind of how we manage these patients. There's some, some really cool stuff that they're talking about. It's like special considerations, like in making sure that we have double IV access, making sure that we're elevating the head in order to improve ventilation as opposed to trying to ventilate them supine. We're also going to be making sure that we're doing temperature monitoring. All this stuff was covered in that GEMS article. And so make sure you check that out and get a good clear picture of what you should be doing in those patients until we start to release our other videos that help you again manage these quite critical patients on the way to hospitals. See you next time.